The clock is ticking for Detroit. President Obama is sticking to promises of change and hope for American autos. But it's the auto industry itself that's got to change. We will not let our auto industry simply vanish. This industry is like no other. It's an emblem of the American spirit, a once and future symbol of America's success. And watching Wall Street, the market's pulling back after a three-week rally. What's behind what you're seeing there in the red? This is the New York Times Special Edition, only on MSNBC. Hello, I'm Tamron Hall. And I'm John Harwood of CNBC and the New York Times. So the big story right now, John, of course, General Motors has 60 days to restructure with a new CEO and Chrysler. Well, they've got 30 days to work out a merger with Fiat. Both companies have serious challenges and changes to make before they get any more of your tax dollars. The president said both companies have a, what amounts to one more lap around the track to end the skid. While Chrysler and GM are very different companies, with very different paths forward. Both need a fresh start to implement the restructuring plan they develop. That may mean using our bankruptcy code as a mechanism to help them restructure quickly and emerge stronger. Now let's bring in Jeff Zeleny. He's White House correspondent with the New York Times. Jeff, it's not every day that the President of the United States in effect fires the head of an auto company and talks about that company moving toward bankruptcy. Uh, tell me what struck you about watching the President deliver this message. What was he trying, who was he talking to, what was he trying to accomplish? Well, John, you're right about that. I mean, I think uh, what this really is is the culmination of all we heard uh, President Obama, then candidate Obama, talking about as he campaigned for president. About um, He talked a lot to and about to Detroit that things had to change there. And today he made clear that that would happen under his watch. He essentially uh, laid down the uh, gauntlet that... Uh, that uh, both companies um, have to uh, change immediately or they will not get any more government money. But politically here, this is very interesting because um, the state of Michigan is a key Democratic state, obviously, and a lot of these industry workers are key Democratic voters. So he had to thread um, uh, he had to thread quite a few needles here over the last couple days to uh, get this to come out. But I think he's trying to strike a balance uh, on all these bailouts that have been going on and try and send the message to the American people that uh, that there has to be an end at some point if there is not restructuring, if it's Wall Street or if it's in Detroit. And what's your sense, Jeff, of how skillfully he threaded that needle? Because on the one hand, he's saying, yes, the auto industry, or GM in particular, is going to survive, and I'm going to make sure they're going to survive. I'm going to stand by and warranty their cars. On the other hand, he says it's going to be a much smaller company, and he's fired the chief executive. I think at this point, it's, it seemed to me like he threaded it uh, fairly well, but, uh, you know, there's certainly... Um, um, We'll have to see how it plays out in terms of how the industry reacts to this, how the workers react to this. Um, Jennifer Granholm you heard and Sandy Levin didn't sound too happy about it. No, you heard Jennifer Granholm, the governor of Michigan, say that he thinks that, uh, or that she thinks that this was not necessarily the right choice. But what is she going to say? She represents Michigan. She's never been exactly the most objective observer here in terms of how the industry has been. Uh, candidate Obama always campaigned on how Detroit would have to change its business model. It would have to change its plan to go forward if it would be viable. So this today was one of the first and biggest steps that President Obama has done. We're told that he found it to be a very difficult move. Uh, Last week in the office, uh, Thursday and Friday, we're told were very difficult decisions he had to make when he came to this, a decision to uh, say that uh, Rick Wagner had to leave. So um, we'll see how, it, uh, how successful it is. But so far, I think he's threaded the uh, needle fairly well. Boy, it's, uh, it doesn't surprise me that that's a difficult decision, Jeff, because there's nothing like you or I have ever seen. Uh, Jeff Zeleny, thanks so much for joining us. John, thank you. And, John, you and Jeff were just talking about Jennifer Granholm, the uh, governor of Michigan, a big name, obviously, in the Democratic Party. And she is not happy, as you mentioned, with the fact that uh, CEO Rick Wagner had to leave the company. Uh, the governor, a Democrat who's been largely supportive of both the head of GM and President Obama, had this to say earlier. I think that Rick Wagner stepping down is a sacrificial lamb, that he did so for the good of the company. He's worked there for 31 years. He's a loyal guy. He's a good man. And I'm not sure that the stepping down of Rick Wagner is going to do much.
So we're going to get into this uh, much deeper when Governor Granholm joins me live at 430 Eastern time today right here on MSNBC. We'll see what she has to say about Jeff saying that perhaps she is not objective about what's happening with the auto industry and developing right now. NBC News confirmed British police arrested five people in London ahead of President Obama's visit. The president lands there tomorrow, but thousands of protesters are already on the ground. Police say the suspect may have been planning to disrupt this week's G20 summit, but they have not said whether there was a specific threat and the president's European tour begins tomorrow in London for the G20. Then it's on to a NATO summit in France and Germany, followed by a meeting with EU leaders in the Czech Republic. Also, the president will end his trip, by the way, in Istanbul, Turkey. Now, NBC's Stephanie Gosk is live in London. Stephanie, what do you expect uh, when the president lands on the ground in London? Uh, I'm going to be joining him for that G20 meeting myself, so I'm particularly interested in what we're going to see. <laughs> well, you're definitely going to see some protesters. There are going to be a lot of people on the streets looking to disturb the process, uh, particularly on Wednesday. That's going to be the largest demonstration, or at least the most confrontational demonstration, most likely, of the week. It will include four different marches that are planning to descend upon the financial, financial district in London, the Bank of England. And the, the goal of those marches is to disrupt the workday and to send a message to G20 leaders that people are unhappy with the state of the economy. Now, back to those arrests that Tamron were talking about earlier. Those five people were arrested under the UK Terrorism Act, which allows police to arrest suspects with no charges. They were found with uh, with weapons as well as radical propaganda. So at the moment they have not been they have not been charged with any crime but will most likely be held for quite a while. John and Stephanie, are you assuming that uh, uh, other than those people, that the disruption that's been planned is supposed to be a peaceful disruption? It's simply to, to kind of get in the way as opposed to uh, something like we saw uh, protests against globalization that turned violent, say, years ago in Seattle when Bill Clinton was president? Well, John, there are a lot of people that are saying that the intensity of the organization for the protests this year are very similar to the kind of intensity that we saw in Seattle in the late 90s. But so far, there have been no overt or public calls for violence. Obviously, police in this city are very concerned that the protests could become violent. They say that it's an unprecedented level of organization that's going into these protests. But for the moment, and we've talked to a number of organizers of these protests, they say they maintain that they are going to be peaceful. Even though members of Scotland Yard will say they are very concerned that they may turn violent, some of the protesters are saying that that's really just a strategy on the part of British security officials to keep people away and to justify, to a certain extent, the level of force that we're going to see on the streets here in the next few days. John? Stephanie, quickly before we let you go, uh, a year ago when he was a candidate for president, Barack Obama was greeted by huge crowds of people, adoring crowds really in Berlin and elsewhere in Europe. Is that all gone now because of the financial crisis? crisis and the, uh, the circumstances these leaders find themselves in, or will that Obama factor offset some of the protests, do you think? Well, it's interesting. You know, it, it, the public at large, both in this country and in Europe, still widely adore Barack Obama. Uh, what we've seen now recently, of course, is European leaders coming out against some of the policy that the administration has been pushing forward, that kind of argument between stimulus and regulation. And you see that pushback in the last week or so. And the administration, of course, backing off a bit on the size of the stimulus proposal that they had uh, originally proposed. But it'll be interesting because I would imagine Imagine the administration very excited to be in an environment where the public widely adores Barack Obama, perhaps giving their uh, proposals a bit of impetus in the negotiation rooms. John? Stephanie Gost, thanks so much. Cameron? All right, John, well, we're following some breaking news right now. We're learning that a magnitude 4.8 earthquake struck before dawn yesterday in a small desert town in California. The town is Bombay Beach, California. We're told that people in the San Jose area felt the shaking. There are no reports of any major damage or injury here. But again, this magnitude 4.8 quake uh, hit before dawn yesterday in a small desert town of Bombay Beach. Uh, what I'm reading here, one report, it says that you were not imagining it. The South Bay was
was hit by a small quake Monday morning. Heads popped up through the uh, NBC Bay Area as people felt that shaker. This is the information that I'm getting in right now from our affiliate in that area. Again, this is a small one, but we've been talking a lot about a, a lot of tremors. I believe it was 200 uh, since Saturday south of this location. Also, another big story we're watching and developing right now that flooding in North Dakota. The Red River is receding, but now Fargo, North Dakota people are facing a new threat. Got a lot of snow on the way. The dikes and levees, for the most part, held back the Red River as it rose to a record high of nearly 41 feet this weekend. But a storm is expected to bring more trouble, about a foot of snow, which could bring in more flooding. Let's check with NBC meteorologist Jeff Ranieri. Jeff, I know earlier today they were saying that it was not the snow that they were worried about as much as the winds yeah. causing those waves to crash up against the levees. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it really turns into, uh, you know, an ocean scenario out here when you get winds whipping these waves at some 40 to 60 miles per hour that some of these wind gusts could be right along the Red River. And uh, that again could produce some two to three foot waves in some extreme cases, which again could compromise those three million sandbags protect, protecting the levees and also the dikes uh, protecting the city of Fargo. Now, while we have seen the river crest, it is still at record levels here running right through Fargo. So uh, the latest numbers show that in our forecast, we're not expecting this to go down substantially until some 37 feet here by Thursday. So not any marked differences until we head into uh, this upcoming weekend. And you can see in this video uh, what we're watching here are these efforts to shore up up the sandbags are dropping these uh, huge piles of dirt basically basically in some of these areas that have been compromised in order to shore it up because this storm system again is now starting to develop now starting to take shape. In fact, blizzard warnings just to the south and the west of Fargo. Fargo is now in a winter storm warning, which will mean totals in upwards of six inches and you can see the winds whipping around this area of low pressure. This blizzard, the latest storm uh, as we could see them again cranking some 30 to 40 40 miles per hour already getting winds uh, sustained above 20 miles per hour. Snow is beginning just to the south, very consistent, very heavy. So our correspondents will be feeling it this afternoon. And there you can see that wide zone of some 6 to 12 inches of snowfall, even isolated amounts in uh, central Minnesota that could be up to a foot. And then again, as we are following uh, the these uh, swarms of quakes in California, we're going to have the latest on that, of course, at weather.com. It's uh, been a big talk out there in California as they have had so so many tremors in just the past couple of weeks and of course everyone asking you know when is the big one going to come so we'll have more on that of course yeah now he eats whatever the president puts on his plate we're talking about Rahm Emanuel Robert Gibbs no that describes more about the vice president's role in the White House than just lunch and coming up an inside look at the work the vice president is really doing behind the scenes and take the money and run or in this case forklift and ATM and drive off. It was far from a clean getaway. The story ahead. This is the New York Times special edition only on MSNBC. After a three week rally, Wall Street is taking a major hit today. You see the Dow is down 280 points. Uh, some of the experts out there say a big part of this obviously is the uh, auto plan from the president saying that uh, GM has 60 days and Chrysler has 30 days to make some drastic improvements or perhaps bankruptcy could be in their future. And now to the developing economic news, GM's new CEO says the company will take whatever steps necessary to restructure and that includes bankruptcy. Fritz Henderson, who replaced Rick Wagner, has issued a statement saying the company faces significant challenges but was fully committed to successfully completing the reinvention of GM. And the Federal Reserve kicked off a two-day policy setting session today. The meeting is not expected to result in a change in benchmark interest rates, which are already at a record low. And the sales of existing homes rose 5.1% last month. The National Association of Realtors attributes the jump to deep price discounts. The percentage gain was the largest, by the way, since July 2003, but sales are still down 4.6% during the past 52 weeks. Now, if you've been watching the NCAA basketball tournament, then you know Every team needs a utility player, somebody who can play anywhere on the court, do whatever it takes to help his team win. For the basketball fan in chief, President Obama, that guy is Vice President Joe Biden. According to the president, quote, Joe's very good about sometimes articulating what's on other people's minds or things they've said in private conversations that people have been less willing to say in public. 
Joe, in that sense, can help stir the pot. Joining us now from Washington is Mark Leibovich, reporter with the New York Times, who wrote that story. Uh, Mark, tell me what sense you got from how uh, Vice President Biden has settled into his job uh, from reporting the story. Well, I, I think it's been surprising to a lot of people, but but Biden has actually had his nose in everything. I mean, you know, you mentioned the utility role metaphor. I mean, certainly they've had such a full plate, uh, and President Obama has not been hesitant at all about you know throwing him into you know running the stimulus package or the middle class task force or some really dicey diplomatic areas, whether it's Pakistan or, or Afghanistan or what have you. So, I mean, I think he was sort of a mystery coming in because he was sort of new to the Obama circle, but it seems like it's off to a pretty it's. I mean, certainly Biden is happy about it because he's doing more than he thought he would. There was some concern coming in that he wouldn't have enough to do. And so I think the relationship has evolved in, in what they would say is a positive direction. Mark, I was struck, and of course, as a sports guy, I enjoyed it by uh, the president in his interview with you describing him as uh, Vic, uh, Dick Vitale might say, as a stat stuffer, one of these guys <laughs> who does things that don't show up in the box score. What was he talking about there? You were describing some public roles that he's taken on, but what are, right. what are some of the private things that Biden is executing that helps the president? Well, first of all, he's, he's in all the meetings. I mean, Obama has had him come to pretty much every important meeting he's done. At the end, which of is not the, always true for vice president. Which is absolutely not always for vice presidents. And I think the dynamic has been that Biden has stayed uncharacteristically quiet through much of the meetings, and then Obama will call on him at the end, and um, Biden will give his synthesis. And, and he's, in a sense, he's a bit of a, I mean, I guess Obama's term was, um, uh, what was it, you know, just sh shaking up the pot a little bit. I mean, he's actually creating some, I think, creative friction in the environment. And Obama also said that people have a constitutional reluctance sometimes to speak truth in front of the president. And, and Biden has actually had that role also. So, I mean, in a sense, he's, he's played behind the scenes a very, very important role more than they thought as well as in front. And from the other side, it sounds a little bit from your piece as if uh, they're leaning on Biden to be a little bit less long-winded than he uh, normally is. You talked about uh, a loose cannon and a laser-guided message machine. Right. Well, that's not new. I mean, that sort of has been one of the tensions between Biden and the very disciplined Obama team from the day he, he joined the ticket back in August. So. Um, I mean, it's something he's continued to struggle at. I mean, as Obama said, the thing about senators is that they are the, the lords of their own domains coming in. And Biden was in the Senate for 36 years. He didn't have a boss except for, I mean, the people of Delaware. But as far as answering to a boss day in and day out, he didn't have that. So this is all new for him. Um, you know, there have been some ups and downs. There have been some, some mishaps along the way that have been pretty well documented. But um, certainly, I think it's going to be, there'll be some, some things probably we'll, we'll point to in the future. But I think it's something he's working every day. Mark, terrific story. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, John. And up next, inside Mexico's drug war, new video of raids across the border. This is MSNBC. Welcome back. Police in Atlanta used GPS technology to locate a stolen ATM literally ripped out of out of the ground with a forklift. The forklift was left on the scene at the Bank of America branch where the police arrived about four in the morning. The machine, or they followed the machine with GPS tracking for several hours before locating it in an abandoned warehouse. The white pickup truck apparently used to transport the ATM was empty, but still running. And as the body count rises in the bloody drug war along the U.S.-Mexico border, some are asking whether this is a war that can actually be won. The New York Times points out that the drug cartels bring in literally billions more than the Mexican government spends to fight them, and informants have infiltrated the top ranks of Mexican government agencies. This as Secretary of State Hillary Clinton acknowledged during her recent visit to Mexico that American drug users are only fueling the violence. And New York Times Mexico Bureau correspondent Mark Lacey wrote about this in a recent piece. Mark, thanks for joining us. It's amazing. I was just online this weekend. I could not believe the number of uh, songs, for example, glorifying Shorty uh, Joaquin, the, the head uh, Mexican uh, drug leader there, and how he is as popularized, perhaps, as some of uh, people see Al Capone in this nation's history. This man has an incredible following. How do they fight or combat the fact that he is now a billionaire? Yes, it's really unbelievable. He was on the Forbes uh, list recently as one of the richest men in the world. Chapo Guzman is celebrated. He's a celebrity in uh, Mexico, but he's also a wanted man. He runs one of the biggest drug empires in the whole country. 
and the authorities, both U.S. and Mexico, are after him, but he's hidden and nobody seems to know where he is. And we talk a lot about this war and you see the heavily armed uh, members of the government there, but it sounds like some of the things that I'm reading, this is also a war of minds. And, uh, and the big question is, can you win a drug war? We, we've been hearing just say no, I think since certainly we were teenagers. Can you win it? Well, it's a, big, it's a big question. The drug cartels in Mexico are no doubt engaged in sort of a propaganda campaign. They're trying to get at the minds of the population and the authorities. So they're doing awful things. They're chopping off heads. They're, they're disfiguring people. And they're hanging up signs all around Mexico saying, we are here and we're in control. So it's really rattling a lot of Mexicans. And you write about the power and the influence they have, and I was curious because you hear, for example, in uh, certain parts of the country, uh, particularly during uh, the years that crack was such a big influence in urban communities, that this was the only way out. This was an option for a, a lot of young people to get out of a hard life. Does it have that same resonance in, for example, Mexico, where people obviously face very difficult situations with the economy and they're trying to find a way out? Yeah, yes, absolutely. There's, there's a real fear that the recession is going to make this uh, situation, this problem, even worse. So the poor farmers of Mexico, the people who, who struggle to get by even in the best of times, are very receptive when a drug trafficker comes along and pays them big bucks to grow marijuana instead of a more traditional crop. So there's, there's definitely an economic uh, component to this, and any solution is going to have to require uh, an economic development aspect as well. And that is in part uh, what the uh, President Felipe Calderon is seeking uh, with the help perhaps of the United States. Yes, that's, that's absolutely. The two most important things for him, though, are the guns and the money that's flowing from the United States on south. And those are the things that he wants the United States to somehow address. But those are tough challenges. All right, Mark, thank you very much. We've got to get to some breaking news, but thank you. We're going to get you updated on that breaking news we're following out of uh, California, a 4.3 magnitude earthquake that's hit 16 miles east uh, or southeast of San Jose. So far, we've been told uh, it has not produced any significant aftershocks, uh, nor did it uh, create any major damage or injuries. But this is coming in. Uh, seismologist uh, with the USGS says it's a 4.3 magnitude earthquake, about 16 miles east southeast of San Jose, and it is located on the Calaveras Fault. That's a major branch of the San Andreas Fault obviously very famous, passing along the east side of San Francisco Bay. And we'll keep you up to date on that. And that the shot that you saw a short time ago, that was the NBC station, KNTV's helicopters, looking for any damage in the San Jose area. We'll bring you any updates that we get in here at MSNBC. I'm Tamron Hall. It's the bottom of the hour. Here are the top three stories. President Obama raised the possibility that GM and Chrysler could be headed for a controlled bankruptcy. He said neither of the automakers proposed enough sweeping changes to justify further federal bailouts. And the chief of police in Carthage, North Carolina, says more lives would have been lost during a nursing home shooting rampage if an officer had not shot the gunman. Eight people were killed Sunday morning. And the Red River is retreating, but a massive winter storm is expected to blow through, packing heavy winds in Fargo. There are some concerns that crashing waves could weaken the dikes holding back the river, and those are your top three stories this moment. Well, GM and Chrysler have work to do if they have any chance of receiving additional federal money. Chrysler has 30 days to get their act together. GM, well, they've got 60, and they must do it without their former chairman now, Rick Wagner. President Obama argued today that GM has made a good faith effort to restructure over the past several months, but their current plan is just not strong enough. This is not meant as a condemnation of Mr. Wagner, who's devoted his life to this company and has had a distinguished career. Rather, it's a recognition that will take new vision and new direction to create the GM of the future. So let's get right to Chief White House Correspondent Chuck Todd. He joins us now from the White House. So Chuck, I'm reading a couple of statements from uh, Senate Republican leaders who are not impressed with what we saw today from the president. Well, it is, but the criticism is still fairly muted. On one hand, there, there are a lot of Republicans that like that he wanted to, that he drew a line and that he won't take bankruptcy off the table. On the other hand, you have some Republicans, like Bob Corker of Tennessee, who's upset by the feel that the event had in itself 
that it's the government taking over a private business, that it was the government saying, Rick Wagner's got to go, government saying what the new board needs to look like, the president up there, and I really think this is going to be one of those moments of this uh, Obama presidency that we'll always look back to and remember when he was up there talking about guaranteeing uh, warranties, the government getting into the auto business in a way actually that it has not gotten into any business on that front. So it's, it's uh, the criticism is just, it's not complete yet simply because I think nobody wants to touch this and Republicans might be happy to just let the president be the lone guy out in front. Yeah, and being the lone guy out in front, we're going to bring uh, John Hartwood in with us in a second, Chuck, but being the lone guy out in front, how concerned is the White House if uh, more jobs are lost and more plants are closed, as the president referred to? Well, look, they're very concerned. That's why this this was a very complete rollout today, right? They had the, uh, the extensions that they gave GM and Chrysler, and where they basically hinted, look, you guys have this specific amount of time, or we will we will have a controlled bankruptcy. Then you had this recovery uh, czar of sorts that they have out of the Labor Department, this ed, uh, gentleman by the name of Ed Montgomery, who's going to be tasked with going into distressed communities that are directly affected by, by some sort of problem with the auto industry. It could be the restructured GM might get rid of more brand names. You might not see Pontiac at all anymore. Mm -hmm. And maybe a town that had a Pontiac factory goes away. Well, what's going to happen to that town? Well, the, the president is appointing this guy almost the way FEMA would come in to a town hit by a tornado. They're hoping Mr. Montgomery can come in and help with maybe it's retraining, help with keeping people in their homes, whatever it is. So they seem to have, they are concerned about this job front because they don't want somehow the president being held responsible for costing American jobs. All right, Chuck, thank you very much for the update, and we'll talk much more about this one, but we want to bring our audience up to date on some breaking news. A 4.3 magnitude earthquake, 16 miles east, east, southeast of San Jose. Let's get more details on what's going on on the ground from the commander David Swing with the Morgan Hills Police Department, uh, 11 miles from the quake epicenter. What can you tell us uh, about this and uh, how severe it is or is not? Uh, it's not, not very severe at all. We've had uh, no calls from the citizens to our communications center. Uh, we've had no reports of damage or injuries. Uh, it's it's uh, business as usual. Um, did uh, people uh, uh, fill the trimmers? I mean, did you receive any phone calls of people, or is it just kind of they know what's going on? Well, we, we did feel the earthquake here at the police department, uh, and we're sure that other people felt it throughout the area as well, but we have not had any phone calls. Uh, telling us about, about how they felt it or, or injuries or damage. All right. Thank you very much for that brief update. Good to hear things are all well and good there. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. Well, bankruptcy is still on the table for Detroit. The president drives home a new deadline for the auto giants. We'll have much more on the president's auto plan next. Plus, from the headlines to the bookstores, the flow of information is moving faster than ever. We'll talk about that and all the news that's fit to print. President Obama faces challenges on several fronts as he makes his first trip abroad since taking office. And not everyone agrees with how he's trying to repair this economic crisis we are in. Helene Cooper wrote in the New York Times, despite his immense popularity around the world, Mr. Obama will confront resentment over American-style capitalism and resistance to his economic prescriptions when he lands in London on Tuesday for the Group of 20 Summit meeting of industrial and emerging market nations plus the European Union. Let's bring in uh, my colleague in this hour, John Harwood, to talk much more about what Helene had to say. John, I know you're traveling as well with the president. I want to start off with the popularity, though. It's certainly, uh, some might say, gotten the president a lot of leeway here in the States. People waiting, and the honeymoon period is, has extended uh, longer than perhaps some of uh, his opponents would have liked. But how will it help him uh, globally here? Well, it's interesting, Tamara. There are a lot of crosswinds heading into uh, Barack Obama as he go prepares to go to London and then on uh, to the NATO summit uh, after that. Uh, look, uh, he's extremely popular, uh, relatively popular in this country, still around 60%, very popular abroad. 
At the same time, you know, Helene was talking about uh, uh, threats and criticism uh, uh, to American style capitalism. You saw those presidents from the uh, comment uh, from the president of Brazil last week about white blue eyed bankers having mm -hmm. messed up the world economy. Right. Uh, so there's certainly tension from those in Eastern Europe and in the so Southern Hemisphere who think that we have uh, made things more difficult for them. Uh, so how does he get cooperation from those leaders and also from France and Germany, which are very worried about inflation? They don't want to stimulate their economies the way we want the rest of the world to stimulate. And then Barack Obama's got to prove that he is shaking up the deck uh, uh, in terms of financial regulation on Wall Street and elsewhere. Uh, and perhaps that uh, move at GM replacing Rick Wagner could be part of a message that, look, we're not standing pat. We're making some changes here. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of people have given uh, quite a bit of airtime to the comments made by German Chancellor Angela Merkel. In part, she said, I will not let anyone tell me that we must spend more money. Put that comment in context. And how does the uh, president uh, deal with uh, the chancellor and others who have that same philosophy on the spending. Well, Germans look back at history, Tamron, and see ruinous inflation in the past. They are not the people who hold the world's reserve currency. The Deutsche Mark is not the dollar, right? The dollar is special in the rest of the world. The United States, using the uh, 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 a good name of the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury, is able to borrow more money than other countries are. So Germany is very reluctant to go along there. Uh, and it's important because they really could be the engine uh, of stimulus uh, in Europe. So they've done some Something, but not as much as the administration wants. And uh, I think what the Americans and the British, who are uh, in concert on this, are trying to get from those who are reluctant to spend more is simply a statement that says, look, if we need more investment, step up at that mm -hmm. point. Don't commit to it now, uh, but be open to doing whatever it takes to keep this world economy growing. And John, I hate to put this in such simple terms, but have we seen any better ideas from other parts of the world since this is a global crisis better than what uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner and the Obama administration has put together here? Well, one of the th if you ask uh, Angela Merkel and uh, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy of France, they would say, yes, we want international regulation uh, that is more robust than uh, uh, Britain and the United States are willing to go along with. I think instead they're going to a uh, lesser solution, a uh, what they call a college of supervisors and some regulators who keep track of these firms that operate globally, that pose some potential systemic risk to the rest of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the U.S. is not likely to, to agree to the kind of regulation that uh, right. Barney Frank recently said we're not going to uh, uh, surrender our sovereignty to some international body. All right, John, look forward to seeing your report. And uh, we have much more in this hour, including the mission to the moon. NASA unveils the Orion spacecraft in grand fashion. You'll see it with us, myself and John. We'll be right back next on MSNBC. Well, Michael Steele, the chairman of the Republican National Committee, says he's done reaching out to President Obama. So here's how he put it in his own words over the weekend. I like the president personally, even though I think he's got a little thing about me. I haven't quite figured out what that is, but you I like it. You haven't spoken to him, have you? No. He, and you've reached out? I, several times, and I'm, I'm done. So there's no bipartisan no, -ism going no, on? No, not that I know of. Is there any professional jealousy? Not on my part. What would I be jealous of? He's the president of the United States. I'm chairman of the RNC, so what's your point? Well, well, Steele also defended himself recently after a string of gaffes, including criticism of Rush Limbaugh, followed by an apology. Alex Volga is a Republican strategist and former chief counsel to Senator Bill Fritz. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Sure, you bet. So what do you make of this? I mean, uh, uh, let me put it, you put it in your own words. What do you make of the conversation you just heard? Well, I think it's a little silly to, to actually expect for one-on-one -on -one engagement between the president of any party and then the chairman of the other party. Uh, I remember when Howard Dean was chairman of the DNC, not only wasn't he meeting with President Bush or talking to him, uh, Dean wouldn't even uh, sit down with uh, Ken Melman, who was NRNC chairman. So I, I think it's much to do about nothing. I really. want to bring in my colleague John Harwood. He's here as well. John? Alex, uh, uh, look, I got to ask you, what is Steele doing? Because as you just suggested, uh, with all due respect to Michael Steele and Tim Kaine at the DNC, the chairman of a political party committee is just not that important a job. It's certainly nothing uh, on par with the president of the United States, yet he seemed to be comparing himself. What is this all about? Well, I, I, you know, I can't speak for the chairman in that regard. His, his job is to serve as the, the opposition, to raise money, to promote our candidates. And I think that's what he's doing. You saw last month the RNC outraised the, the DNC. So I, I think Chairman Steele's focused where he needs to be right now. 
Would you not think he would be better served and the RNC would be better served if he just, uh, like, turned down some of that rhetoric a little bit? Well, look, it's not as if he was the one out there holding a press conference to complain the president wouldn't talk to him. It was a question he was asked, and then he answered it, and that's all. But, Alex, you can be asked a lot of questions. That certainly, we know you have the option not to answer or to uh, take a different route. We see it all the time when people don't directly, and John Harwood, we know people don't always directly answer our questions. They kind I of might go do that around right it. now. Yeah, <laughs> we see it a lot with strategists. So, Alex, I have to ask you, you know, I mean, when he's asked, is there any professional jealousy? I mean, how about just not answering that, saying, you know what, that's a ridiculous question, or, you know, with all due respect, I don't want to get into that. I'm talking about my party. Yeah, th that is one where I think the chairman would have been better served had, uh, had he just refused to answer. It is a silly question. I mean, uh, who else gets asked questions about whether they're jealous of the president of the United States? <laughs> Except maybe well, other Alex people who ran for president. <laughs> Well, Alex, let's just hope the president's not jealous of you right now for being on our show, okay? <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> all right. Well, the New York Times has all the news that's fit to print, and here are some other top stories in today's edition. Free online TV viewing could soon be a thing of the past. Cable companies and TV networks are reevaluating their initial plan to bring TV shows to the web free of charge. Time Warner Cable and HBO are talking about offering online viewing to subscribers only. Now, a dress rehearsal for the opening of City Field for the New York Mets. Just over 22,000 curious fans attended a Big East matchup between St. John's and Georgetown on Sunday amid the sounds of electric saws and men in hard hats milling around. The ballpark formally opens on April 13th for an exhibition game between the Mets and the Boston Red Sox. And Simon & Schuster calls it extreme publishing. Book publishers feeling the pressure of the 24-hour news cycle are speeding up the process of getting volumes to shelves or online and e-book form for current events related titles the nine months to a year industry standard for manuscript to publish book is being shortened to as little as three weeks just in time for John Harwood's next book paperback in May <laughs> Tamron I'm so glad you mentioned that so got to plug that book <laughs> All right, John exactly so look another bankruptcy hearing involving the case of Wall Street swindler Bernie Madoff at issue in a New York courtroom today, an attempt to recover Madoff's overseas assets, including $75 million worth recently discovered in the United Kingdom. British investigators say Madoff's London offices played a significant role in the global fraud operation, calling it a cog in a giant washing machine. And former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez and other former Bush administration officials are named in a criminal investigation opened by a Spanish court. The court is looking into whether Bush officials violated international law by providing the legal framework to justify the torture of prisoners at Guantanamo Bay. Spanish officials say the case could lead to arrest warrants, while U.S. officials say it's highly unlikely any of the people named would be arrested. Spain is claiming jurisdiction in the case because five citizens or residents of Spain were prisoners at Gitmo, have said that they were tortured there. And the latest now on that deadly shooting rampage at a North Carolina nursing home. Police say 45-year-old Robert Stewart had multiple weapons with him when he went into that nursing home and killed eight people. At a news conference earlier today, the Carthage police chief talked about the, the heroic efforts of an officer there. His name, he's 25 years old. His name is Justin Garner. He went into that nursing home alone, alone with no backup and subdued that shooter. Officer Garner did precisely what he was trained to do. If he had called for backup, there would have been a lot more people. NBC's Michelle Kozinski is live in Carthage, North Carolina. Michelle, do we know any more about why the uh, suspect targeted that nursing home? Hi, Tamron. Well, yes, uh, it appears that his estranged wife, with whom he had been having problems very recently, worked at that nursing home. It's still not really clear if she was there at the time. There have been some local reports coming out saying that she was, but police haven't confirmed that. They did confirm that she was an employee at this nursing home, and that is the connection that everybody had been looking for yesterday, wondering why this man would target people who can't fight back, who can't run away, who were just there in their beds for the most part, trying to shield themselves from the shooter with multiple weapons. Tamron. And Michelle, do we know the latest on the, uh, the suspect? I know he, as we mentioned, was shot. What's his condition? Do we have an update on him? 
No, we should know that in a couple of minutes. At least we're waiting for a press conference to start. We know that he was shot one time by that officer in the upper chest. Uh, we also, just a couple of minutes ago, talked to a man who's believed to be the first person targeted by the shooter. This man, Michael Cotton, was visiting his aunt at the nursing home. He just drove up his car into the parking lot. He said it was still rolling. He hadn't even had it completely parked when he looked up and saw a man with a long gun pointed at his head. He said in that split second, he didn't even think it was real. Here's some of what he told us. At first, I didn't really believe it was a real weapon. I thought it was somebody just messing around with a BB gun and pointed it. But then when I heard the window get blasted out, I knew that, you know, this was for real. It wasn't luck. It was divine intervention because the way my truck was shot, you know, I, I shouldn't probably shouldn't be here talking with you now. You know, his story really brought it home, the terror of those moments. He said as soon as the windows were blasted out of his truck and he realized he had been hit by shot in the shoulder, instead of ducking down or trying to pretend like he was dead, he got out of his truck with the gunman still in the parking lot, went inside the nursing home to warn people, and then he went down the hall to try to warn his aunt. And he said within a couple of minutes, he could tell the shooter was inside the building. He could hear shots. He and an employee of the nursing home ended up hiding in a bathroom. They could just hear this going on. His aunt wasn't harmed and he is okay. He just has a pellet lodged in his wow. shoulder. But to be back here at the police station, you know, looking at his truck, which he just claimed, seeing those windows shot out, he said he, he just can't believe it. He said he had a chance to get away or do something and that the shooter seemed really calm and oddly detached, as we've heard many times in similar cases. Shooter didn't say anything to anybody. But this man, Michael Cotton, said everybody inside that nursing home, the patients just had no chance to fight back or do anything. And we're hearing the stories. One woman pulled her T-shirt over her face, not to protect herself, but she said she didn't want to see the shooter shoot her. Tamron. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. New York Times first 100 days on MSNBC. I'm John Harwood. And thanks for joining us. I'm Tamron Hall. Contessa Brewer picks things up from here. Contessa, what's ahead? Well, we've got a lot going on, and I would tell you if I were in front of a camera, but I'm not. Well, you know what? I didn't know you weren't, <laughs> but I'll tell you. We're, Contessa is watching Wall Street. The Dow is down more than 300 points. We'll get it all together. Thank you, John. It's good to see you. Have a good day. You too, Tamara.